This is the things associated with the Hermes or the Hermetic writings. And the Corpus Hermeticorum refers specifically to the books. So the Hermetica might be broader, like anything to do with the Hermes tradition. Corpus Hermeticorum is just the books. Does that, that make sense? We'll talk about this more later, because we're, we're going to read the Corpus Hermeticorum uh, in a week, right? It's that Solomon book that we've got. Yeah? Um, when it does talk about Hermes and the Hermetica, um, can that be strictly just Greek thought, or is this only with the Alexandrian? The, as it passes into medieval thought in both Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it refers specifically to the Hermetic ideas of the Alexandrian school. So the older, whatever older traditions were associated with Hermes turn into myth and literature, and it, it is pretty explicitly related to that one movement. And, and that's because that those are the books that survive. Right? That is to say, you what's remembered is based not on what was once important, but, but what survives literarily that can be read by later generations. So whatever Hermes was like to a classical Greek, what Hermes is like to a Renaissance guy is quite different. Okay? Okay, we talked. Uh, anything else? We will discuss the her her Hermetica later. So, you know, it's, it's a... We'll have a whole period on it. We were talking about the origins of esotericism. We discussed the fact that human nature permits people to lie and keep secrets. We also discussed that uh, as, as humans' societies develop, we begin to get specialized knowledge. This can be specialized practical knowledge, like you know how to make a pot and I know how to make a shoe. And that's technically not esoterica, but it is the fact that there are you know, restricted categories of knowledge, are not necessarily restricted, but one group is efficient in one type of knowledge and another in another, means that that differential creates uh, knowledge that is not universally known. Now that's in and of itself is not esoterica, but when that becomes secret, that becomes esoterica, and when it becomes religious, it does. The other thing to note is that there was age and gender special, uh, specialization of knowledge. That is to say, children, uh, were told certain aspects of human life, not when they're children, but later. For example, sexuality is not talked to the three, three year old, but you know, a more mature kid. Likewise, there was a lot of gender specific knowledge. For example, women had knowledge about reproduction and childbirth and child rearing that the men didn't have. And although in our modern society we tend to want men and women to be equal, in ancient societies they tended to have very gender-specific roles, and also gender-specific knowledge. So, for example, um, knowledge of plants tended to be woman knowledge in Neolithic times. Knowledge of hunting tended to be male knowledge. You see what I'm saying? And uh, some of this was secret. Like, it's likely that the ladies didn't talk to the men about, you know, the child uh, reproduction issues. It was just something that the women knew and the women talked about and the men didn't get involved in it. Now that's not certain, but that, that seems to be based on modern tribal practices, kind of what's going on. Now it, it turns into real esoterica when it's associated with specialized religious knowledge. Yeah, you had a question? Is the secret only, I mean, when I think of a secret, I mean, I think it's like intentionally you're from the person because you don't want them to know. Mm -hmm. But I feel like when you refer to it, it can also just be knowledge someone doesn't happen to possess. Because it wasn't imparted to them. Does that make it also a secret? Uh, well, in practical terms, for what we're talking about as esoterica, it has to be intentionally no. right. Okay. So, uh, but you know, you can have specialized knowledge. Like I don't know anything about how to fix a computer, but it's not because it's esoteric. It's because I haven't tried to learn it. If I tried really hard, I could probably learn it, but maybe not. Who knows? Okay, when we're moving into esoterica, uh, we're talking about religious knowledge. And specialist religious knowledge seems to develop in Neolithic times around figures that are called by uh, historians shaman. Shaman is a specialist in spiritual things. And they seem to have been people that at least were believed by the tribe to be able to encounter and interact with the spirit world 
And, and this was a skill that was considered uh, in part innate in the person and in part could be taught. So the shaman could have a disciple and pass his knowledge on to that. But it wasn't generally known knowledge. Now again, that it, it can be unknown and not be a secret because you know people just don't know it. Like I don't know how to make a pot. But uh, unknown can turn into secret if you restrict the people, the age, the gender, uh, the tribe, or whatever that has access to that knowledge. Once it starts becoming restricted, it turns into more like esoterica. Does that make sense to people, what I'm talking about here? Okay, so there is then specialized religious knowledge that some of it's public and some of it's secret, and that becomes public exoteric versus esoteric. Okay? Now, another aspect of that is that there is things that are known only to God that are the secrets of God. So God, for example, knows how and why the rain, where the rain comes from. People don't know that, but God knows that. So, so God has specialized knowledge that ordinary humans don't have, or God or the gods, right? I mean, just divine beings have that knowledge. And, and that then becomes another form of esoterica, that is divine secrets, divine knowledge. And one of the goals of esoterica is to learn the divine secrets. We call this divination, meaning uh, specifically for telling the future or for telling what the will of the, and the plan of God is. So, the belief that there is divine knowledge that humans either don't share or can't share, and that this can in some way be passed to human beings is another category of, of esoterica that arises. Okay? Another important distinction is between oral and memorized tradition versus writing. Now, um, anciently, and up through really the development of the printing press, writing was a specialized skill and was really esoteric knowledge. And sometimes it was restricted, like only the priests in Egypt could learn hieroglyphics. They had another script that was for the common people called Demotic. Okay, and so you have specialized knowledge in that sense of restriction of writing. But basically, uh, oral tradition can be uh, esoteric if you only tell a few people, or it can be exoteric if you tell everybody, right? An oral story or something. So, so you get the development of oral orality as part of esoterica in that if you differentiate between telling everybody and telling only a few or some people, particular piece of knowledge. So there was lots of tribal traditions that were more or less universally known by everybody, and then there were some tribal traditions that were had restricted knowledge. Likewise, between tribes, you could have esoterica. That is, tribe A and tribe B don't they share some knowledge, like how to hunt an uh, antelope, but they don't share knowledge of, uh, you know, a, a particular veneration of a particular goddess to bring about uh, a successful uh, birth. They might have different knowledge in that. So, so it can be gender specific. It can be uh, um, occupation specific. It can be. Uh, specifically religious, or it could be tribal knowledge, one tribe knows, another tribe doesn't know, and so forth, okay? Now, writing um, changes this to some degree. Writing initially is an esoteric form of knowledge that only a few knew how to do. And as such, it, most of what was written in books was esoteric knowledge. Now, some of it might be publicly discussed, and you do that by publicly reading a written book. That's how most people knew the Bible, for example. Jesus didn't have a copy of the Bible, as far as we can tell from the New Testament. Whenever he reads, is taught, described as reading scripture, it's in a synagogue context, where he's publicly reading a passage and then commenting on it, which was the normal thing to do in Jewish synagogues of the day. So the scripture becomes, uh, you know, if the book of Leviticus, for example, is a handbook of how the priest, what the priest should do, priestly purity laws and running the temple and stuff like that. Uh, that was probably esoteric originally. That is, it was designed for the priests, and they, they knew it. The other guys didn't care about the priestly stuff because they didn't have to do the sacrifices. 
But when it becomes scripture, it becomes uh, a public and it was read out loud in the synagogues. It was no longer an esoteric book. So this could shift as well. But basically, limitations of knowledge of the knowledge of reading and limitations of the availability of books made written texts esoteric. Or, or, or let me say, could make written texts esoteric, right? Today, when you publish a book, you tend to want as many people to read it as possible. Anciently, when you wrote something down in a book, it was a means of preserving and memorizing that text, not to, to publish it, but to simply preserve it. Okay? Generally, if you wanted a, an idea known, you had public uh, discussion of it, oral discussion. Now, this starts to change in, in Greek and Roman times. Okay, so, so those are some of the elements of esoterica that we need to think about as we get into this. So what we're going to find, now we're going to look, start looking at specific examples of this in uh, ancient times, and, and we can see some of these ideas reflected on this. The last thing I, I noted here is there's a huge difference between what was important anciently versus what survives in written texts versus what later groups thought was important. What survives from the ancient world is what medieval Christian monks and scholars thought was important, not necessarily what the contemporaries thought was important, that is the archaic pagans. So for example, uh, literary uh, recountings of myths survive because they were cool stories that were fun and funny or exciting or whatever, and so they, the monks would copy those. Whereas handbooks of how to perform a sacrifice to Athena don't survive because the monks didn't care about that, number one, and probably thought it was evil or bad, number two. And that may have been more important for the day-to-day -day life of the ancient Greek than was a story of, of a god or goddess. Okay? The other thing to note is that ancient books were generally misinterpreted by succeeding generations. Now, I can make that claim only if we assume that we today understand accurately and properly the ancient book. And maybe we don't either. But uh, it, it, even if we don't understand it today, there's enough different interpretations of ancient books, including scripture, to indicate that at least some of these guys have got it wrong, right? I mean, they, they've misunderstood it in some way or another. And that includes scriptural texts. And that's why you get the development of sectarianism, or at least one reason, is because different groups interpret the scripture differently and therefore have a sectarian split over the meaning of the text. And this feeds into esoterica because esoterica is almost always a, or at least in, in many of its forms in medieval times, is a esoteric interpretation of a authoritative text, which is almost always wrong. That is, it's kind of goes beyond what, what the core text originally meant and was intended to Okay, questions on any of that stuff? Okay, now we're going to look at uh, Goodrich Clark's chapter on um, chapter one, which is the background of classical esotericism that survived and became important in the Renaissance. So notice, Goodrich Clark's book is not really about what was important esoterically anciently, but what ancient esoterica got, became important from the Renaissance on and formed what he calls the Western esoteric tradition. So what he does then is, is discuss, uh, he looks at uh, Alexandria as what? What's the importance of Alexandria? Founding place of the esoteric tradition for the Western world, right? And that at least survived. Right, and, and basically, Alexandria became the most important intellectual and religious center of the ancient world. More important than Athens, more important than Rome, from maybe the second, third century BC on, and it remained such up through the Arab conquests. And it declined not so much because of the Arab conquest, but because of the silting of the port and the subsidence of the, of the city. It was built on a delta and it subsided. It's now 
30 feet underground and the port's silted up and, you know, the trade moves elsewhere. Uh, but it also declines in part, well, for, for lots of different reasons. But for about a thousand years, it was the greatest intellectual center of the world. Number two is it happens to be the place where the books survive. And, and this is true of Christianity as well. The earliest Christian theologians are Alexandrians, and they share a lot in common with the Alexandrian pagan tradition. Now, Alexandrian religion was polytheistic pagan. Jews and Christians lived there and interacted with these pagans in different ways and were influenced by them in some ways and influenced them in some ways. But as Christianity takes over in the 4th century with the conversion of Constantine, and then Islam takes over in the 7th century with the Arab conquests, the pagan uh, religion declines and disappears. It's really gone by the time the Arabs come. The middle of the 6th century is it's the last evidence we have of, of uh, Egyptian pagan temple functioning in the island of Philae uh, near uh, Aswan. It was the temple of Isis was the last one. Okay? And same thing in, in uh, Athens at the same time seems to have disappeared about the mid of, middle of the 6th century. So when the Arabs come, classical pagan religion's gone. Now, most of classical pagan religion was unacceptable to the Christians, right? Because it was pagan, it was uh, polytheistic, it was idol worshiping, etc., etc. They were monotheist and uh, uh, opposed to idols. What could survive, however, were some aspects of pagan religion, which include magic, astrology, and alchemy, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. But more importantly, uh, philosophy. Now, mythology survived as literary text, st funny stories about the gods. Later, that's picked up in the Renaissance so, uh, as an important uh, theme when they turn the pagan gods into uh, spiritual beings, angels, or intellects, intellectual powers, or something like that. We'll discuss that a little bit later. So just know, part of the pagan tradition was Christianized and survived, part of the pagan tradition uh, most of the pagan tradition was rejected and not Christianized and does not survive. So we're talking about the importance of certain texts and not other texts. Now, in terms of Alexandrian Hermeticism, and, and these numbers tell you when we discuss these in, in the course, okay? We're going to talk about this in topic eight. We, we've got two major written sources for this. One is the Greek magical papyri, and the other is the Corpus Hermeticorum. Now, um, or sometimes Corpus Hermeticum. I mean, it's called both. I think technically Hermeticorum is better. But uh, anyway, Greek magical papyri are important because it, it is a big book collection of magical spells that were used in the third, uh, second, third centuries AD in Alexandria area. It did not survive as a a, a traditional text. By a traditional text, I mean a book that is copied and then read and copied and read and is passed down generation to generation. It survives as an archaeological text, that is, they found this as a, as a lost book, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, so bear that in mind. This had no direct influence on anybody after them, but it shows you what uh, Greek magical thought was like. And there's indirect lots of parallels between medieval magic and Greek magic as found in the magical papyri. Now, why could a Christian accept? There's actually a collection of Coptic Christian magical texts that parallels this. And I've got in the magical discussion, I, I, I got the source for that where they're translated, and, and you can take a look at that if you want. Why would the Christians accept magic? Well, number one, magic is and science are not distinguished. So if you believe in magic, that is magical powers and different things, that's just a worldview thing. It's not whether you're a Christian or not. Now the question is, can the Christians practice magic? They believed it was real. That's an important thing to know. Magic is real, just as witches are real from the uh, pre-modern Christian worldview. And when we talk about uh, you know, the witchcraft and the witch trials at Salem, we think about how horrible that is, but, uh, and you know, I, 
agree with that. But if you really believe witches exist, and they can really do these things, and those people really did them, then you know they deserve to be executed because they were, you know, doing evil, uh, you know, witchcraft, making people sick, killing people, all this type of stuff. Okay. So the fact that Christians believed in it is is one thing. The other question is, can they practice it? And here becomes a, another long discussion, uh, which we'll talk about when we talk about magic. But just bear that in mind. The, the major text here is the Corpus Hermetical Quorum, which we will be reading. Then the other texts are the Aeneids. This is Neoplatonic. So this is Hermetic, this is Neoplatonic. These overlap and become completely merged. So Plotinus is the, is the first Neoplatonist. means little Plato, right? And he wrote the Aeneids. Actually, most of these texts were not written by the guy they're attributed to. They were written by the disciples who were writing the teachings of the Master. And that's true of Jesus in the New Testament, and it's true of, uh, you know, uh, Socrates. Uh, Plato wrote Socrates' teachings, and um, Porphyry wrote the teachings of Plotinus in the Aeneids, but we attribute it to the guy who's, who's the master of it. He wrote the Aeneids, and, and I will post some selections from the Aeneids for you to read. We're not going to read it all. It's a big book, and it's pretty complicated and pretty arcane. But that's the Neoplatonic tradition. Now, Plotinus, in fact, rejects the Hermeticum. He, he doesn't like the Hermetic guys, but the later people merge these together. Okay, so they were considered radically different by Plotinus. This stuff is too magical. He wants pure intellectual, you know, just thinking about God. It transports you to the, you know, Imperium, and you get to sit and think about God. Chaldean Oracles uh, are another major book, which we'll discuss later, that are the vehicles by which Neoplatonism is carried from classical times into uh, medieval and, more importantly, Renaissance times. And then Gnosticism is another form of ancient religion that survives in, in some ways, which we will also discuss later. So Goodrick Clark is basically outlining the major uh, ancient phenomenon that have a huge impact on Renaissance esotericism. Not necessarily, he's not outlining all the different ancient esoterica, and he's not outlining maybe the ones that were more important anciently than they were in the Renaissance. So just bear that in mind. It is a very limited, narrow purpose for that chapter. Now, if you have any questions on any of that, all of these have been translated into English, and I will give you uh, translation references later, in, in later uh, documents and notes that I prepared. Okay? Anything else? On, any questions on any of that? Then we want to look uh, first at the mystery religions. Now, does... Goodrich Clark mentioned mystery religions. Not really. I mean, he might mention them in passing, but he doesn't discuss them. Why not? They're not important for the Renaissance esotericism. They were more important than any of these other forms of esotericism for the ancients. But they were explicitly and in, in detail pagan. So they were rejected by the Christians, number one. And number two, they were completely esoteric, and we have no written texts that survive describing them. They were purely oral, ritual, and esoteric. There was a famous guy, uh, Alcibiades in Athens, who was kind of a playboy type guy. He was a member of a very rich family. He uh, had been initiated in the Eleusian Mysteries. He got drunk one day and was wandering around the Agora, or the, the marketplace, the big plaza forum of Athens. And he was kind of reciting and, and saying things about the, the mysteries of Eleusius. You know, he was like talking, of, not kind of quoting it and stuff. And they arrested him and were ready to chop his head off and, and because, you know, kill him, execute him for blasphemy because he publicly talked about it. And uh, he was able, because he had a very rich family, he was able to get banished instead. But he was banished from Athens for this and could have been executed. So it was a very serious thing to these Greeks. And it was far more important than the Hermetica, which is a you know, really small little group of philosopher and magician guys. Now, if you want to know more about the mystery religions, we'll discuss them in a second. 
There's a book by Bowden, which is just a really good introduction with lots of bibliography, The Mystery Cults of the Ancient World. And then Meyer has a book, Ancient Mysteries, which is a translation of ancient, all, most of the ancient sources dealing with the mystery religions. Now, the mystery religions were the most esoteric part of ancient uh, pagan religion. And it is related to mysticism because the term mysterion, which from which derives the mystery religion, is the term from which mystic comes from, right? So there is a, a verbal overlap of these ideas. And the overlap of the essence of the idea is that a mystery religion reveals secret nature and purpose of God and the nature and purpose of yourself. In other words, it reveals what mystics were seeking. And it is a secret that God knows that he reveals to his special disciples, which is just how Paul uses mystery language in the New Testament. Paul reveals the mystery of God to the Christians. The ordinary people, even the Jews, they don't know the mystery of God. Paul knows it's been revealed to him, and he will reveal it to the Christian disciples. But the other people don't get it. They don't understand it. It's foolishness to the Greeks, right? Okay, so, so notice, it, it, it has these elements that are uh, parallel, but it tends less to be a personal spiritual quest as it is to be a social ritual that you perform with other people. So there's an overlap of, of mystery ideas within uh, mystery religions and mysticism, but they are certainly not coterminous. So a lot of these things are Venn diagrams, right? Uh, mystery religion here, uh, mysticism here, there's overlap with a lot of things the mystery religions did that the mystics don't do, and a lot of things mystics do that weren't part of the mystery religions. Okay, now what are they? Number one, there is a pagan, public pagan cult, which is, centers around the veneration of a god or goddess. And that veneration is focused on making offerings, singing hymns to the god and goddess or goddess, uh, making offerings, giving a treasure, a votive offering, a prayer, uh, all sorts of things like that. This was public, and it was more or less required. That is, say, if you were an Athenian or you were a Roman, it was expected that you would go to the public sacrifice and the public religious rituals and just participate, which generally meant watching. Maybe sometimes, you know, saying a hosanna or something like that, but generally you were just watching, and, and the priests were running this. Now, what was the purpose of the public religion of, by classical, I mean Greek and Roman, basically? What was the purpose of a, the public religion of the classical world? It was a state religion, so it was involved with blessing the city of Athens or blessing the city of Rome. And it was for prosperity and for fertility and to avert the anger of the gods. So maybe the gods are mad at you because you didn't do something right, and they might send a plague, or they might send a famine, and you want to avert that. So it's kind of ex expiating for sins. That was the function. Now notice, this overlaps with the function of biblical Israelite uh, sacrificial cult, right? It's not exactly the same, but there are, there are certain parallels. What did you want from the gods? In, in performing these public rituals. What was your goal? Yeah? Uh, to get them to like you. Right. It was a bribe to get the God to uh, bless you in some way. Gods were about power and wealth and fertility. That's what you wanted from the gods. You worship the gods because they were powerful, not because they were just or righteous or good. The gods, if you look, read Greek and Roman myths, were often jerks, right? But they were powerful, so they could be jerks. And, and in that regard, ancient pagan religion was quite different from modern religion, which is about, you know, God is a loving being. Uh, you worship God not because he'll give you money, but because, he, he, you know, the blessings are spiritual and uh, things like that. What was the role of salvation? In, in pagan religion. Did you want to be saved? No. No. There's, 
there was nothing to be saved from. Well, you know, if a Baptist went up to a Roman and said, have you been saved? He'd say, yeah, we, we conquered the world. Obviously, God, you know, God loves us. We're the greatest. And they'd say, well, you know, you should worship Jesus. And they'll say, did Jesus conquer the world? And, you know, they just wouldn't understand that concept. Now, salvation, however, in a pagan sense, is related sometimes to the concept of death. That is, can an ordinary human being gain a blessed afterlife? The answer to that question is no. Only the, you know, the emperors can become gods. They can go and dwell in the presence of God. But the ordinary people, they're not going to. Maybe they can get a moderately blessed afterlife, but you know, maybe it's they don't exist. Maybe they're reincarnated. Maybe they go to the land of Hades, who's the god of the underworld, and live on as kind of ghostly shades. They call them shades sometimes. They're shadows of the former being. But... Uh, you know, the blessed afterlife is not an idea. You don't worship the gods to have a blessed afterlife. You worship the gods to have a good this life. Okay? Christianity, note, is an extraordinarily radical religion in that regard because it promised that slaves could dwell in the presence of God in the afterlife. Imagine how radical that was to a Roman who maybe the emperor could, right? But a slave? The gods would love and pay attention to a slave? Come on, give me a break. If they loved the slave, he wouldn't be a slave, right? Obviously. They don't care about the slave. So, so there's a radical difference between that worldview. Now, where it overlaps is in the mystery religions. Because the purpose of the mystery religion was to, uh, well, one of the purposes was to offer a blessed afterlife to the individual. Public religion was about the state, the group, the community. Mystery religions are about the individual. It is a personal choice. And, and the choice is that you make a decision to be devoted to a, as a special client-patron relationship to a particular god or goddess. And, and these could be male gods or male goddesses because this is polytheism, right? So, so what it is is essentially creating a client-patron relationship. Now, do you understand how ancient client-patronage worked? It's a fundamental part of the ancient world. The powerful were patrons, the weak were clients. The powerful would give uh, protection and maybe some uh, you know, land or help to a client, and in return, the client gave loyalty and support to his patron. This could manifest itself in lots of different ways. But in, in mystery religions, you are creating a personal client relationship with a particular god. It is not a public religion where the community prays for blessings on the community. It is a personal relationship in which you try to gain a personal relationship with the god or goddess. Now, this involved learning all sorts of secrets, secret religious ideas, learning secrets about the nature of God and yourself, and then, uh, very importantly, performing a set of secret rituals which essentially create this client-patron relationship. This is the essence of the mystery religion are the rituals that you perform. So let's look at some of these. Uh, they're listed here under the initiation ritual idea here. Okay, number one, the initiate is called a mustai, that is he who's, who remains silent. He whose mouth is shut, he who doesn't reveal the secret, or he who knows the secret. Remember, the core root of musterion means secret or literally mouth shut or eyes shut, maybe, just organs of, of vision and speech shut. It involves purification, where you would, uh, for example, wash your body, don special clothing, wear special hats, or maybe wear a, a wreath, like a laurel wreath, carry on a torch. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things that you would do in that regard. There are secret rituals in, involved in this, sometimes including dancing, sometimes they're sexual. That is to say, some of the Mystery religions are related to fertility, and fertility to the ancients meant life. It means the, the preservation and transmission of life. It, it means reproduction of your children, of your crops, of your animals. That's one of the main things you want from the gods is this maintenance of that reproductive function, because if you don't have it, what happens? You die. You're dependent on your crops, reproduction of crops and animals for food. You're dependent on reproduction of your children so that you have a Social Security and Obamacare because that didn't exist back then. <laughs> if you want to 
not die uh, being an old person you needed a kid. That's why the widow is such an important figure of charity because she has no Obamacare or Social Security. And so somebody's got to take care of her and, and it becomes not a family responsibility, which is what it was normally, but in Christianity it becomes a community responsibility. She is our sister. We will communally take care of the widows. And Paul talks about the widows quite a bit, right? I mean, this is a big issue for him. Okay. Uh, so there's all sorts of rituals they did. Sometimes it was dramatic presentation, sometimes there was singing, sometimes there was de declamation, like a uh, oration or a discussion of stuff, uh, plays, dramatic stuff, all sorts of things. You would learn secret doctrines, that is, you'd learn the real meaning behind some god or goddess's story and powers, sacred drama we mentioned, and then the revelation of the true nature of, of a god or goddess. So to, to explain this, we can look at the Eleusian Mysteries, which is a the mystery of, of uh, Demeter and Persephone. Now the myth of Demeter and Persephone is preserved. We don't know what they did in the mystery of religions, but it had to do with the explication and uh, um, kind of explaining the esoteric meaning of this myth and other related things. Uh, number one, Demeter is the goddess of fertility. She controls all, all life, but especially the life of grain, the reproduction of grain. Uh, she has a daughter, Persephone, who is the most beautiful goddess in the world, and everyone loves her. And Hades, the god of the underworld, who is, he's not an evil figure in Greek mythology. When, when the cosmos was usurped by the Greek gods, remember they destroyed Kronos to take the cosmos. They are usurpers who steal it from, from the creator god, who was evil. He was an evil tyrant. Um, so it's a good thing they did, but nonetheless, they're usurpers. Uh, they divide the cosmos into three parts. The sky goes to Zeus. The sea goes to Poseidon. The underworld goes to Hades, that is, under the earth. And then the earth is kind of shared by all three. Okay, so Hades is the god who commands the underworld. That's the land where the dead go, and it's also all the mineral wealth and things of the world are under the ground. So he, he's the god of that as well. So notice, he's not an evil god. But when you die, you go to the land of Hades. I mean, maybe you just cease to exist, but if you go anywhere, it's the land of Hades. Hades, then, is, is talked about in the New Testament. Wherever we see the term hell... It is Hades in Greek. It's the land of the dead. And, and again, it's not even in the, in the uh, New Testament, it's not necessarily a, a bad place. You can be punished in hell, certainly, but not necessarily. Hades is equal to Sheol in Hebrew, so you've got a, an exact parallel, and they are translated as, uh, Sheol is always translated Hades into Greek and hell into English. Okay, so, so Hades sees Persephone, falls in love with her, he asks to marry her, Demeter says, no way, she's my favorite, I can't bear to be without her. So Hades kidnaps her and drags her down to, to, Hades, to the land of Hades, hell. And she, uh, she's not necessarily opposed to this, but it's, you know, it's not on the up and up. So Demeter freaks out because her daughter's gone, and she starts to panic, and she wanders the earth looking for her, and she's uh, looking for Persephone, and she forgets all of her fertility responsibility, and the whole planet, the whole, well, I didn't conceive of the planet, but the cosmos just starts to die, because nothing is reborn. There's no new life coming. The plants die, the animals die, everything dies. And, and Zeus gets together and says, you know, man, we can't do this. Our whole creation will be destroyed without the meter, so we've got to figure out a plan. So they, he talks to Hades, and Hades basically, they make an agreement that De, uh, Persephone will live half the year with Hades and half the year with Demeter. And when she is in with Hades, everything dies and winter comes. And when she comes back to live with Demeter, spring springs forth because Demeter's happy, she's wonderful. When her daughter's gone, she's just completely depressed and doesn't do her life-giving thing. So part of this is the myth of the Garden of Eden type of thing, where there is a beautiful, wonderful planet that everything's fine. Well, why is there winter? It's because Persephone's gone. So it's an agrarian myth about crops and so forth. That's the essence of the myth, but the esoteric interpretation that the mystery religion gives to it is a little different. I'll get to that in a second. Yes? So is this just a different version of the one where she takes a seven pomegranate seeds while she's in Hades? 
Therefore, yes, yeah, yeah, that's part of the story. Well, it's the, it's the same story, but there's lots of different versions, specific detailed versions right, okay. of it. Right. And I think the one you're talking about comes from Ovid. And he's kind of a late... He elaborates a lot and adds stuff to make him cool. Yeah, I know. And she didn't want to be in Hades, but she had to for half a year because she was a Right, because she ate the pomegranate. I'm pretty sure... Well, okay. I'm pretty sure that's Ovid's later story. But in your age, yes, same basic story. Now, what's the mystery religion meaning of this? It is that Persephone and Demeter know the secret of getting out of the land of the dead, of Hades, right? And they can reveal that secret to their devotees. That is, they can promise them a blessed afterlife. So, so the myth is about agrarian reproduction. The esoteric interpretation of the myth is it about personal salvation, resurrection, blessed afterlife, etc., etc. And so what seems to have happened is when they took this myth, they had dramatic representations of the myth, and then they uh, esoterically interpreted, interpreted it as salvation and immortality, deriving from secret knowledge of the gods that they reveal to their special devotees. Okay? So that's called the Eleusian Mysteries. It is one particular form of mystery religions. That's Elysian. That's a little bit different. Oh, okay. Elysion is the land of the blessed afterlife. And it's it's homophonous but different. Oh. It's actually not homophonous in Greek, but we mispronounce Greek in such a way that makes it homophonous. Okay. Uh, now, we've talked about the Elysian mystery, so we talked about the Demeter stuff. And in Greek, it's actually Demeter and Kore, it's Persephone and Demeter, and so forth. Uh, here's some books with, with the Homeric hymn to Demeter, which kind of is the source of this. But we don't have any details, any certain details of what's going on. We have allusions to it, which are recorded, and we have iconographic, lots of iconography. And, and so we can look at archaeology, uh, iconography, and myths, and combine them together to try to get a sense of these. Another is Dionysius, okay? Uh, another is uh, the great mother, Cabele. And here's Dionysius. Others are Orphism and Pythagoreanism, and we'll talk about those in more detail because these are the two forms of mystery religions that kind of come down in a fragmented form to later esoterica. And then Isis and Osiris is probably one of the main ones. And I've listed here these different forms of it, and the pages in the Bowden book, which is the best introduction, where he discusses each of these. And then he gives lots of references to later uh, sources. Um, here are some of the major sources for mystery religions. Uh, Golden Ass, especially Book 11, which is about how, uh, about the mystery of ISIS, not the Islamist group in Syria, but uh, Isis, the goddess of Egypt. And then this source is a collection of basically all the major classical references to mysteries are included in this. And then there's a whole bunch of other books. Okay, that religion, or, or let, me, let me rephrase that. This is a form of religiosity of which there were several different, maybe a dozen or more different mysteries. They were not exclusivistic. That is, you could join the mystery of Eleusius and another mystery if you wanted to. Hadrian the Emperor, who was kind of a, a philosophical, esoteric, religious guy, traveled, part of his political activity was to travel the different provinces of the empire during his career and kind of, you know, set up everything, make sure everything was going right, lived there for a year, moved to the next province and so forth. He went all around the empire that way, but as he did, he joined all of the mystery religions, every single one of them just to make sure he didn't miss out on the right one or you know miss out on anything in the afterlife. He actually created his own mystery religion based on his homosexual lover, Antonus, who, who died in, in the Nile. Some people think he was, it was a human sacrifice and then was deified by Hadrian and formed his own mystery religion. There's tons of statues of Antonus. It's a very strange story. We don't know exactly what's going on. But there's lots of these different mystery religions. Uh, and, and some of it gets brought into philosophical discourse, 
where it's really more influential, that is, in, in the long term. Because these were pagan mysteries. When Christianity comes along, they are, uh, first of all, uh, state patronage was taken away. Then they were suppressed. That is, you know, you can't do this in public, or you can only do it private. You can't talk about it to other people and try to convert anybody. And then eventually they were completely uh, eliminated, and you couldn't do them anymore. So they all died out in, in the late antique period, 4th, 5th century. All these mystery religions died out. But their influence indirectly uh, continues, especially in Orphism and Pythagoreanism, which we'll discuss in a moment. So this is probably one of the major forms of ancient esotericism, esoteric religion. And it is quasi-mystical in the sense that you, you gain a true knowledge of what you're really like, you gain a true knowledge of what the gods are like, you gain a knowledge of the purpose of the world, and you have uh, salvation occurring. I mean, you, this is what's given to you in, in these uh, rituals. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, it, it varied through time. Initially, for example, you had to be a Greek to join the uh, Lusian Mysteries, for example. Uh, in, in the Isis cult, it spread and everybody got to join eventually. Uh, in the Dionysius cult, uh, it started in, in the east, came to Greece, and then was transported to Rome, and the Romans suppressed it because the ladies who joined it were getting drunk and having wild sex. And so they they basically said you can't do it. It's called the Bacchanalia in the Latin terms, and Bacchanalia now means a, a drunken orgy. And it's because that's what these guys were doing in the, in the worship of Dionysius. But notice, a drunken orgy is, number one, the drunkenness is the uh, spiritual exaltation, and the orgy is the veneration of the uh, fertility god or goddess through the god or goddess's main function in life, which is sexual reproduction. So, you know, we tend to think of it as a, you know, a drunken orgy, which it was, but <laughs> it, it, you know, there was a spiritual mystery behind that. There's a, a spiritual mystery behind sexuality, um, you know, for, for many ancient peoples. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, uh, we're basically out of time. So we will look at Orphism and Pythagoreanism just, you know, maybe 10 minutes each. And then we will press on to the next topic, which I believe is magic for next time. I switched it. So we're doing mystery religions today and then magic and the occult next time. Because that matches better with Goodrick Clark's uh, chapters, how he's got it organized. Okay? okay. So see you.